You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics, our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. To get the annual plan for less than $2.50 per month, search for Economist Podcasts Plus to start listening today. Spin your passion into a business with Shopify and break sales records with the world's best converting checkout. Let's hear that one more time. The world's best converting checkout. Shopify's legendary checkout makes it easier for customers to shop on your website, across social media, and everywhere in between. Now that's music to your ears. Any way you spin it, you can be a smash hit with Shopify. Start your dollar a month trial today at shopify.com slash records. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 92, Interwar Air Power Part 1, So Close, Yet So Far. Before we get started today, I wanted to let you know that on June 25th, I will be speaking at the Intelligence Speech 2022 conference. This is a fully online event where I will be joined by over 35 other historians and history podcasters to discuss a wide range of topics. I will be giving a talk entitled The Correct Wrong Choice, the Interwar Years and Results-Based Analysis, in which I will chat a bit about how we should approach discussions about events that happen before major events like the Second World War. During the session, there will be an opportunity for some Q&A, which was a ton of fun when I did this event last year. If you register before June 1st, you can get the Early Bird Special for just $20, and you can use my code SECOND, that's the word SECOND, to at checkout so that they know that you heard about it from me. You can find a link in the show notes to the event, or you can head on over to intelligentspeechconference.com to register or find out more information. Now back to our regularly scheduled programming. Between the period 1914 and 1945, there would be no area of military technology that would advance more than that in the realm of air power. In 1914, the militaries of the world had small numbers of fragile, wooden-framed air machines that were primarily used for reconnaissance. By 1945, there would be jets capable of reaching speeds of 900 kilometers per hour, strategic bombers capable of dropping thousands of kilograms of bombs at targets thousands of kilometers away. And beyond even the technical advancements, which were staggering, air power would take its position as one of the key areas that militaries had to consider and excel in if they wanted to be taken seriously on the global stage. Within the two world wars that serve as bookends to that 1914-1945 period, there were massive advancements in both technology and theory. However, our series of episodes today, and the one that will occupy the next five episodes, will be focused on how those two things evolved over the course of the interwar period. Coming out of the First World War, the various air forces that had been involved in the fighting emerged from the war having proven their importance and their power on the battlefield. During the war, the more traditional military arms, the armies and navies, had not been able to bring the conflict to a quick conclusion. And while the air forces of Europe had been equally unable to bring quick victory, air power advocates could at least point to the immaturity of air power, both technologically and theoretically. This provided a lot of space for air power evangelists to try and convince everybody around them that air power was the future and that it should be pursued with the greatest possible vigor. Just to quote three of those evangelists as a way of kicking off this series of episodes, here is British General Hugh Trenchard, leader of the Royal Air Force after the First World War, speaking in 1916. Quote, It is the opinion of those most competent to judge that the aeroplane, as a weapon of attack, cannot be too highly estimated. End quote. And here is American Colonel William Mitchell, better known as Billy, Speaking in 1925, Mitchell being well known for his belief that air power would completely change how the war at sea was fought. Quote, air power, both from a military and economic standpoint, will not only dominate the land, but the sea as well. End quote. And then finally, here is Italian General Guelo. Finally, here is Italian General Giulio Duhet, one of the leading advocates for strategic bombing in 1921. Quote, 
To conquer command of the air means victory. To be beaten in the air means defeat, an acceptance of whatever terms the enemy may be pleased to impose. End quote. During this episode, we're going to focus on some of the lessons that nations learned from the First World War and how some of those lessons were applied to the close air support concept that had been used to some success during the First World War and would be a part of many air forces sort of doctrine during the interwar years. Then in later episodes in this series, we're going to look at strategic bombing. We're going to look at some of the air forces of Europe, which will be critical, of course, to our ongoing story. And then also, we will spend some time looking at RAF rearmament in the years before the Second World War as kind of a case study of how some of these lessons and theories were applied. The idea of supporting fighting on the ground from airplanes would be developed before the First World War, almost as soon as aircraft began to enter into military service. They started to try to strap guns to them to prove that they could be used as a weapon, as you might expect. Evolution in this direction would be greatly accelerated by the war, though. In 1914, aircraft were primarily used as observation and scouting platforms, and from that position, the earliest kind of support for ground attacks was sort of dropping simple explosives out of the cockpit, just whatever the pilot could sort of manhandle over the side. From those relatively quaint beginnings, the concepts and capabilities around close air support would greatly increase as the years went by. By the last 18 months of the war, specific tactics and aircraft had been designed to facilitate supporting ground operations from the air. What had developed was the ability of pilots to engage targets on the ground with both machine guns and explosive bombs. There were many differences in the details between, for example, French, German, and British implementations of these practices. For example, the British favored multi-role aircraft while the French and Germans began to develop dedicated ground attack platforms. But they were all achieving the same goals, bringing together the capabilities of air power with the requirements of ground attacks to try and help make those ground attacks successful, in much the same way that artillery was used for the same purpose. These close support tasks were dangerous, both from enemy ground fire as well as from the threat posed by enemy fighter aircraft. But there were some benefits that offensive operations had at this time that they were able to take advantage of. The offensive use of air power, be it in close support tasks, bombing missions, or air superiority missions, always had the benefit of concentration. They were able to pick where they were going to send their planes, and they could send as many of them as they had or that they thought they needed. I'll just borrow a description of the problems faced by defenders in this situation. From rhetoric and reality in air warfare, the evolution of British and American ideas about strategic bombing, 1941-1945, by Tammy Davis Bettle. Quote, the relationship between defenders needed and attackers faced is sharply non-linear. Defenders require a certain number of aircraft simply to cover the relevant airspace, even if few bombers attack. The requirement is driven more by the area to be defended than the size of the attack. Hence, a small attack still requires a relatively large defense to defeat it. But once defenders had deployed enough fighters to make it likely that any given raid will be intercepted, Further increases in bomber fleets do not much increase the number of fighters needed to defeat them. All air forces discovered this in the Second World War, but by 1918, none of them had seen more than small raids, and thus all they had observed were the needs of defending against small attacks, which seemed disproportionate. End quote. I really like this kind of description of how the air forces in the First World War sort of saw the problem of bombers and intercepting them, or really any offensive operations by the enemy and trying to prevent those offensive air operations. These problems for the defenders would not really be solved until radar became more readily available before and during the Second World War. That would make intercepting sort of oncoming enemy raids much easier to do and allow the defenders to concentrate their available resources in a more meaningful way. After the First World War, and after over four years of massive expansion and innovation, every air service had to find its path forward during peacetime. For many of them, for example the French or American militaries, the air service was still under the control of the army. But in Britain, the Royal Air Force had been created before the end of the war. This put the RAF in an interesting position in which it had to justify its existence in a way that was not present in many other militaries. It was impossible for any serious military observer to say that air power was not important, 
but the RAF was faced with the added requirement of convincing others that they needed to be separate from the other services and that they needed continued funding. The RAF, with Trenchard at its head, would push for the idea that air power could help maintain control of the British Empire, doing basically what the British Army had been doing for generations, only at a much cheaper cost. The exact efficacy of these policies and the RAF's actions is kind of out of the scope of this episode, but it is a good example of how air power would push beyond its First World War experiences after 1918. There were many advocates for air power that were trying to find a way to push air power forward in a world of greatly reduced defense budgets, and pushing into areas like aerial policing is an example of one of those attempts. Another area would be the growing belief that strategic bombing would be a critical part of the next war, even though it had played only a very marginal role during the First World War. We will discuss the efforts of those strategic bombing evangelists next episode, but for the rest of this episode, we will focus on close air support, an area where air power had been used for real impact during the First World War, but which would have to grow and evolve just like every other facet of military technology and theory during the interwar years. Asante came to TurboTax after graduating from culinary school and landing a job in the hottest kitchen in town. My hands are full all day, every day. I love it. Asante, as your TurboTax expert, I'll make your moves count, guaranteeing 100% accurate filing and your maximum refund. Sound good? Yes, expert! Switch to Intuit TurboTax and make your moves count. See guarantee details at TurboTax.com guarantees. Experts only available with TurboTax Live. Some of us love history. Others used to or never did because history was presented as nothing but the rote memorization of names, dates, and facts. Basically, the story got left out, and that made history kind of suck. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a university professor with a PhD in history, and bringing history to life is my passion. That's why I created my podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. I want to teach you everything you need to know about U.S. history, but I do so through stories. Let me tell you about George Washington begging his men not to mutiny against Congress. Clara Barton saving Union soldiers amid enemy fire. Enslaved Frederick Douglass risking his life for liberty. And about so many other figures as their real experiences make industrialization, social movements, and even congressional debates and tax policy come to life. Subscribe to History That Doesn't Suck today. And join me, Professor Greg Jackson, every other week for a new episode. Where I'd like to tell you a story. As I mentioned earlier, it took some time for close air support to have a meaningful impact on the fighting during the First World War. This impact was felt after many years of slow innovation in how aircraft could be used. But then after the war, close air support became a topic that was greatly discussed, if only because the various groups involved had different views of its importance. From the side of the armies, they considered it to be incredibly important and to be the number one reason that air forces existed in the first place. Because of course they did. This may have been the views of army leaders, but aviation leaders had a different view of how their resources should be used. The details were always different from nation to nation, but at a basic level the disagreement was around how closely tied should aviation resources be to ground actions. On both sides there were selfish reasons that the ground and aviation forces had their own desires around how best to use air units and how those units could be used to support events on the ground. From the side of the ground units, aviation assets were just a way of making their efforts more successful, and the closer the air and ground units worked together, the more effective they would be. From air power advocates, they wanted some level of freedom to decide how best to use their own resources. They did not want to be narrowly focused on the targets that the army demanded. Beyond these more selfish reasons, there were also fundamental disagreements about the best type of targets to hit. Beyond just wanting to control their own resources, many aviation leaders just clearly believed that their air units would be most effective when providing what they would call indirect support. Indirect support meant supporting ground units, but generally by attacking targets that were disconnected from the immediate fighting. An example of indirect targets might be enemy artillery positions, or transportation and concentration areas, or communication hubs, and, and similar targets. 
there were really good reasons to pursue this type of action, especially during the 1920s and 30s. One challenge was identifying targets on the ground, targets that often did not want to be seen, especially with the ever-changing nature of the battlefield. Soviet Aviation Authority A. Lapinski would say, quote, The further we go into enemy territory, the more we can count on very important and immovable targets. And on the other hand, the nearer we are to the battle, the more we will have to count on what is called the emptiness of the battlefield, end quote. Even if the pilot could find the targets they were looking for, that just introduced the next massive problem, hitting it. It was very difficult to hit targets on the ground from any reasonable height, but anti-aircraft fire was very potent, which caused pilots to want to fly quite high. But above 10,000 feet, which is where many pilots wanted to stay, there were very low bomb hit rates. For example, the Luftwaffe put the percentage of hits from 12,000 feet at less than 2%. And that's when they were trying to hit a target the size of a football field. That's pretty rough, especially when many targets were much smaller than a football field. These very real technical challenges were used as reason for the support of greater freedom of operations for air units, which would be more or less successful based on the nation. But the core idea is simply a disagreement about how best to use aviation resources and how they could have the greatest impact on the ground battle. Each of the nations that would have air forces during the Second World War would approach ground attack and close air support differently during the 1920s and 30s. Some would create dedicated units quite early, like the United States in 1921, while others would not devote specific resources to the problem until the 1930s. Budgets were always problematic and resulted in there never being enough time and money spent on refining the ground attack concepts. For example, in the United States, the 3rd Air Attack Group would be founded in 1921 and would contain four dedicated attack squadrons, but a few years later, two of those squadrons would be deactivated due to budget cuts. Finding money was just one of many problems that were common in most air forces as they tried to refine ground and air coordination. Another major problem was around how to communicate between the two groups. Now, the technical side of this problem had been solved with the creation and and miniaturization of radios so that they could be put in aircraft. That had kind of created the critical link between ground-based units and aircraft in the air, and that had been done during the First World War. The larger problem was wrapped around the question of who on the ground was the one calling for air support, and how did they get the information from units at the front? The further forward the link to aircraft was when placed on the battlefield, the more timely support could arrive. But the further back it was, the greater visibility there could be to the action along the entire front, and the greater ability to concentrate and prioritize available aviation assets. It was a balancing act that shifted based on available resources, technologies available, and doctrine. For example, the French which set a system where an air support request had to go quite far up the chain of command, had a system where it could take four hours for a request to result in a dispatch of aviation assets. Another difficulty was around properly modeling air-to-ground operations during peacetime exercises. Developing exercises that accurately represented the realities of combat is an entire series of podcast episodes all on its own because it was very difficult and and nations were not always successful at it. But at the basic level, it was basically really challenging for militaries in the 1930s to not just predict what the war would be like, but then to develop and execute exercises with peacetime resources that in any way resembled the demands that would be placed upon them in a time of war. Close air support was no different in this regard, with many nations not being able to accurately simulate combat operations which for some nations would result in overly complicated demands being placed on ground control and pilots as they tried to coordinate their attacks. It was very easy for the actual mechanics of the actions between the two forces to become massively overcomplicated, resulting in a system kind of breaking down during the stress of combat. Even with all of these challenges, some nations would put a lot of effort into making their processes work, and there were many who believed that the tasks of supporting ground units would be essential in the future. For example, here's a quote from American Billy Mitchell on the ways in which attack squadrons could be used. Quote, During offensives, attack squadrons operate over and in front of the infantry and neutralize the fire of the enemy's infantry and barrage batteries. 
On the defensive, the appearance of attack airplanes affords visible proof to heavily engaged troops that headquarters is maintaining close touch with the front and it's employing all possible auxiliaries to support the fighting troops. End quote. Mitchell's quote oh, at the end there touched on an important aspect of air support that had been learned during the First World War, its impact on infantry morale. There are countless accounts from the war about how air superiority over the battlefield impacted the soldiers on the ground. For example, here's one German soldier on the Somme on July 20th, 1916, in an area where the British had put a lot of effort into gaining and maintaining air superiority. Quote, Our infantry up front had come gradually to the belief that they had been abandoned. We cried once more and in vain for some help against the aircraft. End quote. Probably the best known of all of the militaries when it comes to close air support is the Luftwaffe. However, this reputation was actually built without having many dedicated close support squadrons when the war started. The Luftwaffe had for much of its existence, put most of its focus on what it called indirect support, basically preferring targets close to, but not directly engaged in the fighting. This was reflected in its force structure, with only one dedicated close support unit at the start of the war, which was flying the Henschel 123 biplane, not the Ju-87 Stuka, which would become synonymous with close air support over the following two years. That did not mean that German squadrons could not provide direct support to ground units when required, but there was the belief that focusing on slightly more distant targets would be more impactful to the overall course of a campaign. But they were in no way against working closely when necessary, and over the course of the opening campaigns of the war, they would develop the experience and processes to get around many of the problems that were experienced in the pre-war years. For a bit more information about the Luftwaffe, you can refer back to episode 83, and don't worry, we will be discussing their actions early in the war at great length over the coming months. In Britain, the relationship between the Army and the Air Force would be, if anything, far more tense than in Germany. The Royal Air Force had made its case that it needed to be a separate service entirely, a separation that had been granted during the First World War. It would then spend most of the interwar period trying to maintain as much of that independence as possible. By its very nature, close air support missions meant sacrificing some of that independence, even if only temporarily, as units were put at least under indirect control of army officers. This, along with the belief that there were better things for attack aircraft to be doing, meant that the RAF put relatively low priority on all close air support tasks. In the years before the war, RAF leaders would add the events in China and Spain to their list of arguments as to why this was the best path to pursue. As with any argument about military doctrine during the period, they would also refer back to the First World War, stating that those who wanted to spread out aviation strength to various army units were forgetting how critical it was to be able to maintain the ability to concentrate resources on a single task, something that was felt to have been critical to the British Army being successful at the end of the First World War. In their view, it was much more beneficial for the British to plan to have their bombers try and create an impenetrable ring around the battlefield to prevent enemy troops from joining the battle instead of focusing on troops that were already in the battle. At the same time, fighter squadrons could seek out and destroy enemy enemy aircraft that entered the battle zone. While preventing the enemy from interfering with the ground battle, it was also a hope that this would better preserve Royal Air Force strength, with concerns that missions over the battle area would result in an unacceptable and unsustainable attrition rate. There were, however, dedicated units that were responsible for working with the ground troops, and they were generally called cooperation squadrons but these were primarily designated for reconnaissance and observation. They were not necessarily attack aircraft. Overall, the resistance of Royal Air Force leaders to really commit to the task of close air support meant that even if it was a subject that was covered in Royal Air Force regulations, it was not well supported or well thought out, and the troops were not well trained in it. As war grew closer, there was increased political pressure to see that the Army and RAF worked closer together, given the growing commitment of Britain to France and generally to ground-based warfare on the continent. But there was simply an unbridgeable divide between the two camps. For example, in March 1939, General Wavelwood, in a report based on a recent joint training exercise between the Army and RAF, say, quote, They showed conclusively that 
that the RAF had given little or no thought to the problem of close support of ground operations, that their pilots had not been trained to this form of war, and that the results to the targets provided were extremely poor in consequence. I doubt whether the exercise occasioned even a ripple of thought about close support to pass over the minds of the air staff. End quote. So not only did he insult the results, saying that they were really bad at what they were trying to do, he also made it clear that he didn't think that the air staff even cared about the thing in the first place, and that the poor results would probably have little impact on future actions. None of these issues had really been resolved when the BEF went to the continent after September 1939. Some amount of air support was provided with an initial 12 squadrons of bombers and fighters, but they were still clearly not set up or structured in a way that lent themselves to easy coordination between the Army and Air Force. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join me next episode as we dive deep into an incredibly important topic for the interwar years and into the Second World War as well, and that is the topic of strategic bombing. It was so impactful to overall air planning before the Second World War, so important to air operations during the Second World War. And so we need to talk about whether or not that significance that was placed on strategic bombing was perhaps overblown, you know, the effects of it were perhaps overestimated, and what was the state of strategic bombing going into the Second World War.